So greet each other in the name of Jesus. Tell each other and remind each other that he is risen.
team uh, for leading us this morning. Um, you know, they got word pretty late that Ashley uh, wasn't be able to be here, and they, I think they pulled it together and sounded great. Don't you guys? Something sound great? Awesome. Um, uh, I just want to come up here, and if you're new here, welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. If you are new here, we have uh, on the bulletins there on the back, you can peel off this little paper here and fill that out and throw it in the offering plate for us. It's going to allow us to get connected with you, allow you to uh, send you some more information about all the things that we have going on here, and if you, if you are new here or you haven't been here uh, in a little while, because um, of w whatever, um, I just want to uh, share that if you haven't met me yet, I'm Daniel, uh, Daniel Hampton. I'm the, can I say new? I've been here a year now. Am I allowed to say new? I'm not new anymore? Okay, all right. So I'm the, I'm the youth director, and uh, so if you, have, uh, if you have someone that, if you have a, a, a grandchild or a child that's that age and you're wondering, is there anything for them here? There is. We got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we have uh, youth every every uh, Sunday. At, no, not tonight. Every other Sunday. <laughs> uh, spend time with your family tonight. Uh, but uh, at 5:30 on uh, on Sundays and uh, six o'clock on Wednesdays, and uh, it's a great time. We actually uh, next Sunday. Uh, I haven't announced it yet, but uh, Scott Carter, the founder of uh, Hearts on Fire, is actually going to be preaching for our youth. So that's going to be really exciting. They don't have to hear me. Um, so that's going to be great for them. So it's going to be a good time. Um, but. Thank you again for coming. Um, I'm, there's also a lot of ch great children's programs that we have going on here if you haven't uh, get, got connected with that yet. and We have Sunday school classes and new ones being started. So if you want to uh, get involved here, come talk to one of us and we'll, pl we'll plug you in somewhere. There's somewhere to plug in here and we want to get you involved. So um, I'm going to lead us in a prayer as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings. And then after that, the youth are going to lead us in. A, in a we've just worshiped through praise and now they're going to worship through a different uh, method that, uh, that I enjoy a lot, and I'm sure you will as well. So uh, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are a God who saves. Thank you that you are a God who reigns now and forever. And we don't have to worry about your reign coming to an end because your reign will last forever. We thank you for your victory that you, that you won on this, on this day so many years ago. And we thank you that you've included to allow us to share in that victory with you and be a part of your kingdom and made us into your own. God, as we, as we move now from a time of praising you through, through worship, through a time of, of giving and worshiping through that way, we pray that you would take our gifts, we pray that you would use them, that you would um, multiply them, and that you would help us to share more people with more people about your kingdom, about how you are the God who saves, so that they can become a part of us here. That's the rule first. Should we pray? Amen.
too hard. I am the shepherd and I am the dog. I am the good news to the bound and the I am. I am. Christians claim that Jesus rose from the dead. One way is to say they hallucinated. Another is to say that the disciples were like the boy in the movie The Sixth Sense who says, I see dead people. <laughs> but there's one detail that these sorts of objections fail to consider. 
the empty tomb. Here are a couple of reasons why we think Jesus' empty tomb is a matter of history. First, if the early Christians were merely hallucinating or the appearances of Jesus were merely visions, well, then skeptics could have easily produced the body since it's reasonable to think they would have known the location of Jesus' tomb. Surely, the guards ordered to watch the tomb would have known the location. Moreover, Jesus was a popular preacher and was placed in a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin. So skeptics would have had no problem proving the tomb was not empty and falsify the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. But of course, this didn't happen. Second, the empty tomb is attested to by six different sources that range in dating from six to 60 years after the reported event, which for ancient literature is gold. For example, we have Paul's creedal formula in 1 Corinthians 15, three through five, which dates to six years after the alleged event. Paul says Jesus was buried and raised, which implies the tomb was empty. Mark's account of the empty tomb comes from source material that scholars date to seven years after the event. Matthew and Luke's account, along with Luke's record of Peter preaching the resurrection in Acts 2, are right at 30 years removed. And finally, John's Gospel makes for a sixth independent source, which dates to approximately 60 years after the event. Since the skeptics never produced the body, and the empty tomb narrative meets the criteria of multiple attestation and early testimony, we can confidently judge as a matter of historical inquiry that Jesus' tomb was empty as the New Testament records. As to why it was empty, the early Christians said he rose from the dead. And since we have good reason to believe they weren't lying, we can trust their testimony and profess Jesus is risen from the dead. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is risen. Happy Easter. He is risen indeed. They said that we wouldn't know that earlier this morning at the 7 a.m. service. Jesus loves you. I don't know what else you know today. If you don't hear anything else I have to say, Jesus loves you right where you are. You don't have to get fixed up. You don't have to get cleaned up. You don't have to get out of your mess. He'll accept you right where you are, and that is the great news of the gospel. Welcome today. This sermon is titled Rushing and Running, and today we're going to be looking at an empty tomb and what the disciples and some of the others did when they found out that Jesus was not in that tomb. As for earlier, we had a little bit of a silence there. It was awkward. I was coming up. I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I wasn't going to dance, amen, but I thought I might have a second offering. That would be a good thing to do on Easter morning, right? And I saw a lot of beautiful dresses on little girls and on women coming in today on their Easter Sunday morning. It reminds me of a story I heard about a little girl who was rushing to church. She was dressed in her Sunday best running as fast as she could, trying not to be late for her Bible class. As she ran, she prayed, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. While she was running and praying, she tripped on a curb and she fell, getting her clothes dirty and tearing her dress. She got up, brushed herself off, and started running again. As she ran again once more, she began to pray, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. But please don't shove me again. <laughs> God doesn't shove us. He would never do that to us. But sometimes when we're running and rushing in life, we do stumble and we do fall down. Maybe I'm the only one. I shouldn't put that on you fine Methodist folks here this Easter Sunday. But sometimes we do stumble in this life. And thank God for the mercy and the grace and the blood shed on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. That's the reason we're here today. We serve the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, a risen Savior. We don't have a religion where we can go to a tomb. We know that he is in heaven, that he lives, and he's coming back one day soon. I believe we can relate to rushing and running in life. Anybody ever late? You ever late for work? You late for a meeting? You're late in the airport. Last week we were flying back and forth uh, from Las Vegas to visit family, and 
There at one point going into Dallas, we had less than an hour to go to another gate, which was in another area of the airport, and you have to really take off to not miss that next flight. That can be stressful. But today I just want you to take a deep breath, rest, relax, and let's see what we can learn from Scripture in the book of Luke, verses 55 and 56 of chapter 23. And let's see how we can apply this to our lives today. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. So they rested as required by the law. The followers of Jesus, they were Jewish, and they were used to doing what the law prescribed, which on Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, they did no work. They weren't allowed to do that. So Jesus' body was placed in the tomb on Friday, and they were unable to go and anoint his body to prepare him for burial. So they had to wait until early Sunday morning to get up and go take care of our Lord Jesus. The law, thank God it was fulfilled. Thank God we don't have to follow those tenets of the law today. We have the freedom in Christ Jesus. Now, the law was not bad. God gave us every bit of this, every, every chapter, every verse. All 66 books was given to protect us, not to harm us, but to help us. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, if you will live by the, the promises in this word, you will be blessed. You will be better off for it. It's the instruction manual for our lives. But Friday was a dark, dark day. It was a dark night. Have any of you ever had a really terrible Friday? I've had terrible Fridays in life. And your first point is a question, how do you handle the horrible days in this life? How do you handle the loss of a loved one, expected or unexpected? Bad accidents, illnesses, injuries, relationship problems, financial issues. How do you handle those bad Fridays? It's ironic, as I was typing this sermon out, the Friday previous to this in November, I had had a really bad Friday. I had a call from my doctor saying that the diagnosis was not good. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I was angry and I was upset and I was concerned. And I know that at times we all get angry, we can get concerned in this life. But I, I just walked through that and I dealt with it. And thank God I'm healed today. I believe that I'm doing good and I've used modern medicine as well as the prayers of many of you as well as spending my own time in my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You have that personal relationship because it makes all the difference in the world on a horrible day, on a horrible Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or any other day. If you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it can be very difficult to walk through the dark days in life. I didn't walk alone, however. I walked with other brothers and sisters in Christ and I shared with them, and I had their prayers, and I had their input, and I had their help and assistance. I had the church family that you surrounded me, that you lifted me up, that you helped me in so many ways. I also did the practical. I did the research. I looked into laser ablation, and I looked into all the different treatments from surgery to uh, proton therapy. And then Missy and I decided the best thing for me was to go through the proton therapy and today, I believe that I'm on the right path from all my blood work, from all the input that I have from medical professionals. And I feel great for what I have been through. So how do you handle those horrible days? How do you handle the terrible days? I, today, I'm preaching as a cancer survivor, amen, and I'm thankful to God because he still heals. And I'm thankful for your prayers and for your concerns. So what happens next in the Bible, verses 1 through 7 of Luke 24? But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in. But they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking for the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, 
and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And your second point is obvious, but it's so important. Jesus is not in the grave. He is risen from the dead. If he had not, we would not be here today. What hope would we have had he have perished and stayed in the tomb? But because of that empty tomb, we have hope. Because he's the first fruits. He's the first one to come out of the grave. And if he's going to come out of the grave, I'm going to come out of the grave too. Amen. That is great news. Look at your neighbor today and wake up and say, Jesus is alive. Now look back at that neighbor and say, Jesus is risen. If Jesus walked out of the tomb, I'm walking too. That's a lot to remember, but try. I know what I'm getting ready... I'm getting ready to do a wedding for a young couple in the church, and I love doing the counseling and whatnot, and we always have to chop it up in real small segments because if you put something out there that's a long sentence in front of them on that nervous type of energy day, sometimes they stumble and you really have to, to help them along. So I need to work on that too when I have you all talk to one another. But as I said earlier, you know, God did this for us. He knew after Adam and Eve sinned, he, he saw the death enter into them garden of Eden and into the world the wages of sin is death but while we were yet sinners Christ died for us you don't have to get cleaned up first that's the great news of the gospel all have fallen short of the glory of God we have all sinned we have all messed up but God through Christ Jesus gives us that blood that shed that pays our sin debt without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins the Bible tells us that's the great news of the gospel do you know him today? What better day than Easter Sunday of 2022 than to surrender your life, will, and emotions to Jesus if you have not done that? So what do the women do next? Look at the next verses, 8 through 11. Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. And the point I want you to catch out of this is they rushed back to share the good news of the gospel. And your question today is, who have you rushed to tell the good news? That Jesus lives. Have you told your family members that are far from God? Have you told a neighbor? Have you told a co-worker? Is there somebody maybe the Holy Spirit's bringing to your mind right now? Who have you shared or maybe have not shared, have not rushed to share the good news? We should be rushing and running to tell everybody that we can the good news that Jesus lives today, the great news of what he's done in our life, how he has transformed us, how he has healed us physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, financially, in whatever way that God has blessed you, your mess can be the greatest message. Your test can be a testimony. You can reach people I cannot because of your experience and where you've been. Never be so ashamed of where you've been that you're not willing to share your testimony with someone else because that person may be going through that very thing right now. And if you can reach into their life, you can say, yes, I understand. I've been there. I've done that. I've had that addiction. I've been in that wrong relationship. But God, that's the hope, the good news that we have to share with the world that God can change us. He can change anyone. These women were excited to share the good news that Jesus was not there, that he was alive. So what did the disciples do? Many disregarded. They said, oh, these foolish women, what are they talking about? But let's look at verse 12 and see what Peter does. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Peter heard. He heard the story of the women that had rushed back. And what did he do? Peter ran. He wanted to know. He ran toward the hope that his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was alive, that he had risen. And he started to find out that he saw the empty tomb as well. He knew that Jesus was not there. So what will happen when you share this good news with the lost? Some will reject us. Some will say, go away, you Jesus freak, I don't want to hear that. But others will listen and they will run toward that hope because maybe that's the moment in time that they need that hope, that they're ready to grab a hold of what Jesus did for us. Peter ran toward that hope, your fourth point. 
that the women gave him regarding Jesus. Did you? Have you heard the gospel, but you've never run toward that hope? You've never accepted that salvation? Today would be a great day. What will happen when you share that good news with the lost? We don't know, but it's our job to share it. And let me give you some, some really great news. It's not up to us to save anybody. The Holy Spirit knocks on the door of their hearts. The conviction falls upon them. They have ears that can hear and eyes that can see. It's just our job to share the message, to share the love of Jesus Christ. And until you build a relationship with someone else, it's really hard to do that. I was in a meeting this past week, and, and someone was talking about, well, I try to go pray with this one, and I try to go pray with that one, and I just sometimes we get rejected, and there's people in here in this part of the organization that won't listen or they won't allow me to pray for them. And I just sort of spoke up. I felt like, do we just be friends with them? Have we ever just talked to them? Have we gotten to know them? Have you shared? Have you listened? Because if you don't build a relationship with somebody, if you don't have a little change in their pocket from interacting with them, from helping them, how likely are they going to be to listen to you about this or anything else in this life? We can't just take this and bludgeon people in the head with it. They don't respond. They respond to the love to the mercy, the grace of Jesus Christ. It brings men and women to repentance. So that's what I encourage you to do is to build a relationship, if nothing else. Once you build that relationship, then you have that opportunity to share the good news of the gospel. And lives can be transformed. Our lives should be transformed. If you don't have transformation in your life, if you're not growing in your relationship with Christ, if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, growing inside of you. Maybe you need to check your own salvation to make sure that you know that you know that you know. But I love that the Holy Spirit goes before us. He prepares us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, how to witness. He shares with us this good news. Verses 1 through 9. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Do you still stand firm? in the gospel. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. And he goes on to discuss how he was seen by Peter and the twelve and by so many hundreds of witnesses. And then he says, I also saw him. He was a first person witness. And I was in law enforcement for almost 15 years and I learned from investigating cases and investigating crimes and seeing people that were telling you what they saw or versus what someone said they heard they saw. And you know what's only admissible in a court of law is people who actually saw it with their own eyes, eyewitnesses. They're always the best witnesses. And the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus saw Jesus. He encountered our Lord Jesus Christ. And your fifth point is the good news saves you. That's what it says in those verses. The Apostle Paul understood this good news, this grace of God is what saves us. Paul tells about the resurrection and its importance in the following verses. So we can close this sermon in a few minutes. Verses 12 through 20. But tell me this, Paul says, since we preach that Christ arose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the dead from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of all your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. We're not believing in a false God. He's just making this argument here. He understands that Christ is is who he said he was, that he is risen. In verse 20, he wraps it up. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all 
who have died. And that's our next to last point, your sixth point. Our Christian faith rests upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he was resurrected, because he defeated death, hell, and the grave, because all authority has been given to him. One day we will come out of that tomb too. I don't know how old you are in here, but a hundred years from now, none of us will likely be alive anymore. It's the most we can have is 120 years. Most people don't make it nearly that far. And we'll lay these earth suits down. But because of our personal relationship in Jesus Christ, because we believe he is who he said he is. What have you done with Jesus? Do you believe he is who he said he was? Have you surrendered your life, will, and emotions? Have you confessed your sins? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is God? Do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? He is who he said he was. And have you turned from your ways of doing things and started to walk by the instruction manual? Do you have fruit, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control? Are you growing in that fruit of the Spirit? But without the resurrection of Christ, without the empty tomb, what hope would we have is what the Apostle Paul is telling us. In closing today, our last verses in this chapter tell us verses 21 through 23 of 1 Corinthians 15. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, through Adam. Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, through Christ Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. That encourages me. I lost my mom in 2020. And I know that we buried her. I can take you to Bethel Cemetery, right where she, her body was laid. But thank God she's not in that earth suit. She's present with Christ. And that gives me encouragement to know that one day, all of our dead loved ones in Christ who have accepted him, who have truly followed him, will rise one day. They will be resurrected. Those physical bodies will come out of the ground or whatever form they may be in. And our final most important question today, if you've been asleep, wake up, elbow the person beside you. Do you belong to Jesus Christ today? Do you? We're eternal beings. One day we will die if God tarries. He doesn't come back and take his church. You're going to spend eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell. A lot of people would like to argue that hell is not an existent place, but it's in the word. And I believe everything in the Word. I believe that our salvation is through Jesus Christ. Do you know Him today? I'm going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. Do you belong to Jesus today? In your heart of hearts, don't think about the person beside you or the front or behind. Draw a circle around yourself today, just you and the Holy Spirit. Nothing else matters in this life in comparison. Is the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart? The handle's on the inside. God is a gentleman. He will not force himself upon you. You have to willingly accept Jesus as Lord. What's the Holy Spirit telling you today? Are you his? Are you sealed for the day of redemption? Is he inside your heart? Or do you need to know Jesus today? Do you need to surrender? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, hell is real, but so is heaven. And God didn't create hell for us. He created it for the devil and for his angels who rebelled against him. You may say, well, Pastor David, I just don't know. How can a loving God send anyone to hell? I don't believe that he does. I believe we send ourselves. The better question is to ask, how could any one of us reject a loving God that would send his only begotten son to be beaten for me, to be striped for me, to have a crown of thorns placed upon his head, to be spat upon, to be cursed, to willingly allow the Romans and the Jewish people and all of us to crucify him, to nail him to a cross. 
where he died naked and bloody. He did that for you. He did that for me. To pay our sin debt. Jesus came to save you. Have you made that decision today? Like I started out this morning, God loves you. Jesus loves you right where you are. I don't care what mistakes you've made. I don't care what relationship you're in. I don't care what addiction's in your life. He can set you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If that's you today, I'm just going to ask you to just to slip up your hand. If you say, Pastor David, I don't know. I prayed a prayer one time. I got baptized one time. I'm a member of a church, but I really honestly don't know if I were to die this afternoon where I'd spend eternity. If that's you, no one's looking, just raise your hand. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to encourage you. If you're watching online, this applies for you too. I'd love to know if you make a decision. Just pray a prayer like this if you need to know Christ. Say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I confess with my mouth that Jesus, you are Lord. I believe in my heart that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. I call upon the name of the Lord because your word says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter said in the book of Acts, repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He'll accept you right where you are. And he'll help us get cleaned up through the Word of God and through his Holy Spirit. If you prayed that prayer, we're going to stand and we're going to worship God in a moment. I'm going to ask you to do something old-fashioned, and that's just step out, walk the aisle, come down, take me by the hand. Say, Pastor David, I prayed that prayer. I meant it. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. There's no better day than right now. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know that we'll have breath. We don't know that we'll live tomorrow. If you need prayer for any other reason, physically, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, if you've had a really bad Friday, if you've had a really bad news, let me join my faith with you. Let us pray for that situation. God bless you. Let's stand. Let's worship God. Thank you for being here today. I'll be here till the last person leaves today. If you need prayer, don't leave our church today without coming to see me. Join me as we pray. Father God, I just thank you for all that you are. I thank you for Resurrection Sunday, for Easter 2022, that we have hope, that we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we worship not as those without hope, but of those with hope of eternal life because of what you, Lord Jesus, did for us. Go before us throughout our week. Make our path straight. Make it clear. Keep us safe from harm, from illness, from injury. God, help us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. 
Let us love everyone that we encounter. Let us run to someone to share the good news of the gospel. In the days when we tend to rush around, let us slow down. Let us spend time with you and your word and help us to share the good news with everyone that we encounter. Pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.